7.22, an exercise about weak convergence. So let's just start doing this. We'll do one direction first. Suppose Fn goes to F weakly. So for all i in C not x star, i of Fn goes to F. So, this convergence implies that the supremum over all n of i f n is finite. And that is because i of f n, well, let's see here f is in C0x, so i of f is going to be some, so here this is uh, some complex number. And so, so for every single i of n, it gives you a complex number. So you're not going to have a particular i of n where it's like, oh, we took i of this f n and we ended up with infinity. That's not going to happen because then i wouldn't be in C0 star, C0 x star. Um, so what would have to happen would be that this this uh, supremum would have to be infinite in the limit. But that can't happen because this converges to I f. And so using that fact, you, you can conclude that this supremum has to be finite. Um, Now let so then the set script A, which we define to be the sequence F n, and this is a little easier than just using the index n, um, or at least it'll be more clear what we're doing. This is contained in L. Is this right? No. This is not... I, I wrote it's contained in linear functionals from C0 x star star to C. What I meant to write is either L... I either, I either meant to write this or this because these are the same thing. But instead I wrote that, which is just kind of a combination of the things that were going through my head, but is also wrong and would be triple star, which doesn't really come up much. And so the set script A is such that it is contained in here, or however you want to phrase this. And what else? The supremum of overall fn hats in script a of fn i equals the supremum overall n of i fn. This is finite for all i in c0 x star. C is Banach, so C zero x star is as well. So where are we going with all this? Hence, by the and what am I going to say? What huge theorem am I going to use here? I'm going to use the uniform boundedness principle. we have that the supremum over all of these guys f n hat which is equal to well th this is finite here I'll write it this way infinity is greater than this which is equal to the supremum over n of all f n u which is one of the things that we wanted to conclude. 
next, um, if we use, now I'm not sure if this is quite necessary, but I find it useful to think this way, at least for this part. By the Reed's representation theorem, fn goes to f, should make that look like an arrow, weakly, if and only if for all measures mu, for all complex measures mu on x, the integral of fn d mu goes to the integral of f d mu. Why would this be easier? Because this could help us get pointwise convergence. How does this do, the, do that? So for any x and x, the delta measure, the measure, the delta measure is, has measure one, if x is in there, measure zero, if x is not in, in there. And that's certainly a complex measure. So, fnx, what's, how can we write fnx? This is the integral of fn with respect to the measure x, with the delta x. And this, because of weak convergence, this converges to the integral of f d delta x, but this, by definition, is just f of x. And so, fn goes to f pointwise, as desired. So yeah, that's a really nice way of using measures, is that me measures are kind of... I. I like being able to think of measures in, or think of this part of this problem in measures because it's easy to go from convergence um, with respect to integration and it kind of jumps out at you like, oh, I could just use the delta measure. Um, so anyways, let's do the converse. Uh, Suppose one, suppose one and two. What are one and two? Glad you asked. Didn't feel like rewriting those. So let M be the supremum over all N of F and U, which by one is finite. So, sure, let's write that. Um, that's zero to infinity. Let mu be, let's see here. What is mu? Okay, so, Take any mu in mx. Um, I claim, what do we want to show? We want to show integral of f and d mu goes to the integral of f d mu. Now, what would we like to do here? Uh, what's, what's a big thing that we've done about taking fn's in integrals and taking it to f. Um, it rhymes with schmominated schmum schmermans. So we like to apply dominate convergence, but we can't because this is a complex measure. But we can fix that. So let... So... write mu as the sum, and I'm going to do this weird thing that I like to do, where I kind of write all the things that I want to write over themselves so they don't have to like rewrite stuff. So this is the sum, this is a sum of, okay, so where each mu r i plus minus is a positive measure. So basically what I've done here is this is the real, the positive and minus real and imaginary parts of mu. 
And so this sum would look like plus i to the zero mu r plus, and then you just kind of make it the way it should be for all the others. Basically, um, when there's a, th this is just the four measures, the real part and the imaginary part in each of their respective pluses and minuses. And then in order to get mu, you have to add and subtract them and multiply them by i if necessary. And you, you just do it the way that you would normally do it. Um, but I don't want to write that out because that takes time and space. Space time. So, since this is in here, mu x is finite, so mu ri plus minus x is finite. What does that mean? That the function that is constant, the Function that is constantly m is an L1 mu ri plus minus because these are finite measures. So, by dominated convergence, we can apply dominated convergence because we have real measures now. I mean, no, positive measures. That's what we need. Um, Integral of fn d mu, then this is r or i or plus or minus. So we'll converge to the integral of f d mu r i plus minus. And that's for each, uh, each of these four combinations. Um, so integral of fn d mu equals integral of f d mu. And this holds for every single measure mu in mx, and so hence fn goes to f weekly. I would write this complete proof here, but I don't have the room, or I don't want to try it, but this completes the proof.